Greetings, YouTube. Back in the day when I read fiction, one of my favorite genres of fiction was science fiction. And amongst those of us that enjoyed it, we would often say that it should be more properly called speculative fiction, because sometimes it didn't actually deal with science, hard or soft, just with speculation about the past, present, or future. Well, the book I'm going to review today what if the moon didn't exist? Voyages to Earth that might have been by Neil F. Combs, or Comins, is what I could be what I would describe as speculative science. It is a book full of pretty much nothing but what ifs. I'm going to run down each chapter for you to give you an idea of what's in the book. Now, one thing I did enjoy about this is that the author speaking about alternative Earths. In every chapter, he gave that alternative Earth a name. That way he could refer to them at a later time without having to go through a long explanation. You know, the one we talked about last, you know, the one that had no moon and that one? Yeah, by giving each a name, he made it much more concise, much more easy to understand, and I think he gave it a certain exotic flair. Um, so the first one was, what if the moon didn't exist? And it was called, and the, he called it Solon from the word solo. And the basic idea being that because the moon is not there, the Earth is spinning a whole lot faster, the tides are a lot different, um, life is going to be much more difficult to evolve. Now one thing the author did throughout this book is that he made this assumption that pretty much the life we have here now would be the life that existed then, and how would the different Earths he's discussing affect the life form that we have in our world. The reality, however, is if you fundamentally changed the look of the world, no moon, for example, you were going to be fundamentally changing the types of life forms that evolved there. Now, I, don't, I think he did this because he would have been dumping too much data into each chapter. It would have been making things more complex than he wanted. But I think he missed a golden opportunity there because there are some wonderful speculation he could have done. Um, admittedly, I'm a big fan of biology and what has been and what could be and what will be. So I think that idea appeals to me a great deal. It may not appeal to other people. Um, the next chapter is what if the moon were closer to the Earth? And he called it Lundholm. And interestingly, there's something called the Roche limit. And the Roche limit is the minimum distance two objects can be to each other or in an orbiting objects without one ripping the other apart. If it gets too close, we would just peel the surface of the moon off and turn it into a ring. It needs to be beyond a certain limit so that doesn't happen. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and the effect that having heavier tides and the effect on uh, the speed that the moon went around, things like that. Uh, next chapter, what if the Earth had less mass? Which, and he called it um, patil off the word petite. Um, so he basically made the planet less dense than it is, so the gravity was a little a little lower. Kind of an interesting idea. Of course, flying is a whole lot easier in a world like that. What if the Earth were tilted like Uranus? Now, he called it Urania. Now, Uranus is tilted. Now, we are tilted at 23 degrees. Uranus is tilted, so it is perpendicular to, um, or, a, you know, actually, perfectly parallel to the solar plane, um, which is, means that our seasons would be really screwed up. Um, and you're talking, you'd be getting huge variations in temperature all over the planet. It would, it would be a very tough place for life to evolve, I think. Um, interesting, but very tough. Um, what if the sun were more massive? He called it grand star for additional gravity. Um, or grand. Um, and there is, again, you can only have the star be so large before it ceases to be able to support the life that we need. So by increasing a, s a small amount, he increased it by 50%, um, he was able to then show how that would affect everything. The, the, he actually had to move the planet out to where the asteroid belt is, our, our, the planet Earth, otherwise it would not have, life could not have evolved at all. Of course, much longer year that way. Um, what if the star exploded near the Earth, called Antar? And the idea is what happens if there was a supernova very close to us. 
how would life be affected? Um, what if a sun passed near the solar system? They called it Cerberon. So essentially, if, what happens if a, a rogue star, and they do exist, gets really close to our system, close enough that it actually hits one planet, pulls a couple out of orbit, capturing one and kicking one off into space forever. And what would happen to our planet, to the rest of the solar system, and to the effect it would have by moving things around and stuff? Um, what if a black hole, black hole passed through the Earth, called it Diablo? Now, if a black hole passes the, through the Earth, we are all dead. Okay, there's pretty much nothing you can do about that. However, if it's a primordial black hole, and they're very, very tiny, I mean, like, the ones he's discussing has had an event horizon only this big. So it was like a ten thousandth of an inch in size, very small black hole. Um, and what happened to the planet and things like that. But interestingly, he also talks about what happens if it were to strike the moon, in his example, on the way out of the planet. But the description he gave me was almost identical to what is shown in the movie The Time Machine, the remake that was made a few years ago. Because the moon has shown up as having been broken up in the film. And I can never figure out how the heck did the moon break up. Well, this explanation of a primordial black hole being very tiny, hitting the moon, because even a black hole that tiny is going to have the same mass as the moon. It's going to do a huge amount of damage to the moon, but not completely destroy it. But it will rain debris onto our planet, which is definitely not good for us. Uh, but it was an interesting th idea that, I mean, this guy wrote this book long before the movie was ever made, and it's just that, that what he's describing would have been fit that film perfectly. Um, seeing the world through infrared colored glasses. When he talks about can you evolve life that uses other wavelengths to see with. He talks about infrared, um, x-ray, uh, I think he also discussed radio waves. And how that, how that would work, it, it doesn't work well. Infrared works almost well, but the other ones don't. Um, and then, uh, let me see, we got from new worlds to our old world. What if the ozone layer were depleted our planet? Now, he gets a little preachy in this chapter. Um, I, I felt that it didn't really fit into the rest of the book, which was pure speculative science. Now we know a lot more about this, the, the ozone layer and things like that than, than when this book was written. Now, I think that this book is a must-read for anyone who, well, anyone who enjoys science, good science writing, because it's excellent science writing, but anyone who likes hard science fiction role-playing games. Because this would give you a lot of information on how to design planets that are going to feel and act and function real. I also think it would be very important for anyone who writes science fiction, short stories, novellas, novels, because if you're into hard science fiction, you want to design alien planets that kind of make some sense. This book will give you ideas about how to do that. Um, I thought it was definitely uh, a, a good read. I'm glad I picked it up. I picked it up uh, at a yard sale for less than a dollar. Um, I saw it used on Amazon. I think it was like nine bucks or something like that, plus you know, throw in three dollar shipping. But it's worth your time. I really enjoyed myself. And uh, I'll be keeping this one because it's definitely a good read.